Well, good afternoon, Harrisville Baptist Church. Hope you're having a wonderful Labor Day weekend, and we hope you enjoy, if you have the opportunity to be off tomorrow, uh, hopefully you enjoy a day off and time with family and friends, and uh, hopefully you stay safe and do uh, everything you can to, uh, to have a good time, but to do it in the right way. Uh, and uh, we had a great morning this morning. Sorry, again, we had some technical difficulties. We are asking for prayer for whoever the AT&T technician is that comes out this week. Uh, that We scheduled them about a little over a week ago. Appreciate Angela getting that set up uh, to come take a look at our internet. Um, it's hit or miss. It's the best we can do, but we want to make sure we're getting what we pay for. So appreciate you bearing with us if you were watching the service this morning and uh, got to see it in two parts. But uh, uh, we're glad to have you with us here this evening. And uh, we're going to continue in our study of the book of Hebrews. Uh, I want to go to the Lord in prayer as we get started before we open up his word and uh, read from it, teach from it this afternoon. Let's pray together. Father God, we love you, Lord, and we do thank you, Father, for, uh, for your sovereignty. God, we, uh, we, we thank you for your goodness all the time, but Lord, we thank you that you're sovereign, that you are above all and over all. God, all the things that matter, all the things that are worthwhile, all the things that are good are only the things that come from you. God, help us to live that way, to, to not only say it with our mouths, but to believe it with our hearts and, and to live it with our lives. God, we thank you, Lord, that because of that, we can seek the good things that come from you. And Lord, thank you that you don't withhold them from us, but rather you, through Christ, allow us to participate in the things that are of you and that are good and, Father, that are worthwhile. And Lord, part of that is you being over everything. God, you are on the throne above all else. Father, above our own opinions, above our own thoughts, our own comfort, above any other throne that, is, that exists in anywhere in this earth at any period of time. God, you're above everything and everyone. Lord God, we thank you that in that, you're the one who sets up covenants that last. Covenants that are right, covenants that are pure, covenants that bring salvation and that bring hope and that bring the future of eternity with you. Lord God, as we talk about that a little bit in Hebrews chapter 8 this evening, Father God, would you help us to learn a little bit more about who you are and who we are in you and who we can be in you if you are allowed by us to, to, to build us. God, thank you, Lord, that you don't need our permission, but Father, you are gentle with us. And Lord, you let us come to you as you draw us. Lord, let us do that obediently and excitedly. Speak to us now, Lord, through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, before we get to Hebrews chapter 8, as we pick up in our study here that we've been doing on Sunday nights, I uh, just want to tell you that I'm thankful for our deacons, thankful for the meeting that we've had this evening uh, or this afternoon and, uh, and for, for the, the leadership that they uh, provide for our church, that God uses them to do so many things behind the scenes to, to not just make decisions and approve or disapprove things, things like that, uh, that, that so many times we think about when we think about deacon bodies. But, but I'm thankful for godly men who, who seek God's will and who seek God's will for their lives and their families, but also for his church. And uh, just thankful to serve with them and uh, look forward to sharing with you more about what was talked about today uh, here this coming Wednesday night as we are, are able to, to make all of that public. So pray for them as well, continuing going forward as they continue to lead. We're asking this year's deacons are to, uh, to give us an extra couple months of service, uh, but we're also working on uh, deacon nomination that we'll be doing uh, in a different way, but a new way uh, as we come up, as we uh, see who God's gonna put into that body for the coming uh, church year and years to come. All right, at any rate, uh, Hebrews chapter 8 is where we're going to read this evening. We're going to pick up there. Uh, we talked about last week Melchizedek, all things Melchizedek, and who Melchizedek was and, and how Jesus is like him in description but is above him as he is above all things. The writer of Hebrews has been setting up Jesus and explaining him as our high priest, as our great high priest, greater than all the other earthly priests that have ever existed or ever will exist. He is the ultimate go-between between between us and God the Father, and he does that because he is perfect and also because he has experienced humanity and done so perfectly. Um, so with a new high priest, the, the high priest was, uh, had many duties and, and has many duties, um, but the, the best of that and the most of which is to uphold and to, and to exercise uh, the parts of the covenant for, uh, for people going back to God. And so um, that's, that's what he moves into next. He mentioned already that we have a new covenant that's brought in by this new high priest, Jesus, uh, and that the new covenant is better than the old covenant. 
Uh, and, and the idea there is that it completes it. it. The old covenant set up the futility and the new covenant brings um, the, the actuality of salvation. And the futility, of course, in the Old Testament is that we can't find our own salvation. We can't make our own salvation. We can't do enough to be forgiven on our own or to be found righteous before the Lord. But the new covenant offers all of that through the work and the person of Jesus Christ. And so in verse eight or chapter 8, verse 1, we start and we pick up and we read. Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. Time out. It's nice when he points out the main point for us, isn't it? Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there were, are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one, other, one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Well, so we see here, uh, as, as we see a lengthy quote from the book of Jeremiah and prophecy there, uh, we see here that, that Christ is not only our high priest above all other high priests, but he is in fact the mediator of a new and the new covenant between God and his people. Uh, in verse 1, he, he says, now the main point of what we're saying is this. He, again, nice that he points that out for us. We do have such a high priest. In other words, that high priest that he's described up to this point, especially uh, in chapter 7 and, and the ones follow, or, or preceding that, uh, the, this perfect high priest he's been discussing, we have that high priest. We indeed have that level of high priest, the highest of high priests. We have the right high priest and the one that was promised to come in Jesus. Uh, we do have that high, such a high priest, he says, who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. This is a direct reference to Jesus and the prophecy concerning him and this Christ being the one who had been promised for so long. He says, and he also who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up, tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Now this refers to the fact that Jesus is still active as high priest. He is still, uh, he is still doing the will of the Father when it is pertaining to us. He's still interceding for us. He's still fulfilling the duties of the great high priesthood. He's still doing that, but he's not doing that in some earthly temple or some earthly tabernacle, some earthly building or location. He's doing that at the very and in the very presence of God the Father. And so that's where, of course, we know that the scriptures teach us that he ascended to after he left here and where he waits for the Father to turn to him and say, go and bring my people, in which time he will return and, and he will come back and, and collect his church, collect the, those who are saved, those that are in him, and usher in the new, uh, the new kingdom and the new Jerusalem and the new eternity uh, that we'll be living in, those of us that have put our faith in him. And so he's, he's serving there, not in, in something that was made by man, but he's serving in heaven. He's serving in the, in the very place where God is. Uh, remember the tabernacle in the Old Testament, Moses was instructed to build it. It was a, it was a thing that traveled with them as, the, as they went through the, uh, 
through the, the, the wilderness and, and working their way to the promised land. Uh, the tabernacle was very specifically built, and it was built, as we'll read here, as we already read a little bit, we'll talk about more in just a second. Uh, we, we read that there was a reason for it being so specifically built. It wasn't just thrown together. It wasn't, there weren't any corners cut on it. Uh, it was a specific representation of what is in heaven. And that is indeed where Christ is still working and will continue to work until he returns as our high priest there. So we have this high priest, he's saying. He's described this high priest that is greater than all, that is above all, that is the ultimate and the necessary high priest. And he's saying we do have him. And this is Jesus, and he's working right now, even as we talk, even as at this point for him, the writer of Hebrews, as he wrote this and as it was being read to those who would first hear it. In verse 3 we read, Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one, this high priest, Jesus, also to have something to offer. In other words, this is part of the concept and the duty of a high priest. And so Jesus follows and fits into that description as our high priest also in this. And, and the idea here is, is that it is important if there's going to be a covenant, there has to be someone who's the mediator of the covenant, the one who, who sees to both sides of it, who works both sides of it in obedience to God. And so Jesus is that one. And so he would have to have something to offer. It says, if he were here on earth, he would not be a priest. This is verse 4. For there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. And so what he's delineating here is he's not talking about the gifts of sacrifices here on this earth. We know that he's already made the ultimate sacrifice, and he's already said such uh, in the book of Hebrews in previous chapters, uh, that he's already made that sacrifice, and it's once and for all. Um, and so it's not that he has to continue to give that sacrifice over and over again, but he has given a sufficient sacrifice sacrifice. And so the earthly priests may still give their sacrifices, but that's not what's needed at this point. Um, and so Jesus is on a higher level. He says, talking about the priests here on earth, he says, they serve, in verse 5, at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. And God said to him, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. The things that we're doing here are representations of what we will do in eternity. When we gather to worship the Lord, well, that's a, that's a representation. Uh, that's a, that's a, a smaller, much smaller version of what we will spend eternity doing. That's praising the Lord, seeing that he is holy, that he is worthy, and, and worshiping him for all of eternity. Um, and, and so we get this understanding that for those of us who have put our faith in Christ, we are living out a, rep a representation, not a full representation, but a representation of, of what kingdom life is and will be. And so he's saying that the, the, the priests that serve on this earth, the, the tabernacle, then later on the temple, those are, uh, those are earthly reproductions um, and, and representations of what is in heaven. So in, in there, you had a throne room, which would have been the Holy of Holies. Uh, you would have had the part behind the curtain where God uh, symbolically lived. And, uh, and that's, that, that's a representation of the throne room of heaven. Um, the courts and things like that represent where we will all be in eternity in heaven when we put our faith in Christ and, and, and get there to that time where we'll spend the rest of, uh, of all of the days that are uh, in, in faithfully worshiping God without sin and without disease and without fear and all those things that plague us now. He says, they serve in a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow. In other words, it's not as good as. Better is still to come. More accurate is still to come. More faithful is still to come in eternity. But what we do here is a, is a representation, is a, 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 a copy or a shadow. Uh, it's a hint of what is to come. And uh, he says uh, that Moses was told to build it just as he was shown on the mountain. It's important and it's important for the temple and the, and the tabernacle and the, and the place where they do their sacrifices and, and do their acts of worship, it was important that that represent well what was described to them by God. Well, for us as Christians, it's important that you and I, our lives, represent well what will be going on in heaven. If we're not doing it now, I don't know why we would expect we'd be doing it then. If we're not desiring to glorify and worship the Lord now, then, then the thought of heaven being that for eternity may not even be appealing to us. We certainly look forward to the time where sin is gone and death is gone and we're reunited with other loved ones who have also been in the faith and, and have passed on before us. But, but if, if we're not about glorifying the Lord now, then it's going to be hard for us to understand what eternity is going to be like. It's a, right now is a copy. It's a shadow, even in our own lives, in how we live out our faith to God and our faith in Christ. In verse 6, we see, 
But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is the mediator and superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. Now he switches gears here in talking about Jesus as the high priest to talking about the covenant. So let's break down that, that verse there in verse 6. The ministry Jesus has received is superior to the ministry of the priest. Well, we've talked about that, that, that he's doing things on a much grander and, and perfect scale, more perfect scale than what the earthly priests do because the earthly priests are limited by being earthly priests. They're, be, they're, they're only humans. And so they have to have uh, interaction with God and sacrifices for their own sins as well as for the sins of the people. Christ had no sins, and so he's above that. We've been talking about how he's above all of this. And this is setting up, talking about this new covenant for the rest of the book of Hebrews. Um, he says, so just as he is higher in his duty and his, his, um, excuse me, his ministry is higher, then also the covenant that he mediates is higher. Well, they were mediators of the covenant that God had given to Abraham that includes Jesus, but is not specific in that, in, in that Abraham wasn't walking around proclaiming the name of Jesus. He didn't know the name of Jesus. Um, he knew that his, his, his family, his descendants would be blessings and would be blessed. Um, but we don't know until the New Testament that that is exactly in the form of and in the person of and in the work of Jesus Christ. And so, again, we see this, this bettering in that it is completing. The, it's not that the, God tried the old covenant and now, well, I need to do a new one because the old one didn't work. It's not in a failure way, but it's in a way that God saw that was set up that way to, to point out uh, and to point towards Jesus as being the mediator and the substance of the new covenant. Um, he says that, that just as Jesus' ministry is superior, so is the new covenant superior because it's built on better promises. Well, what, is, what does that mean? What are the better promises? Well, it's so much more specific. It's so much more complete. Um, the idea of the Abrahamic covenant that the people were living out was, uh, and, and even the Mosaic covenant, all of those were, were, were great things that God promised to them and great blessings that he promised and, and great responsibilities that he put on the people to fulfill their end of things. But greater still and, and complete compared to those is the, the, the promise of the new covenant in Christ, that we would have eternity with God in heaven and that we would be on his side and in his family as his people. Verse 7, he says, for if there had not, if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. Now here's a place where the English translation fails us a little bit because you say, wait a minute, well, I didn't think God did anything wrong. And the idea here is if the, if the first covenant had not been incomplete, there wouldn't have been a need for the completion of the other one. And we'd have lived on in the, in the Old Testament covenant. But that's not the case here. We, Jesus, Jesus did come. God did send his son. And, and he did establish and has established the new covenant to complete the work of forgiveness and reconciliation that the old covenant just began to point to and, and started the process of. In chapter uh, 8, verse 8, we read, But God found fault with the people and said. In other words, it wasn't so much that God messed up on his part of the covenant, but the people didn't fulfill their end. Did God know that was going to happen? Absolutely. But nonetheless, it happened. And so the people didn't do it. And so he chose, and he, he even said way back in Jeremiah that this was going to happen. And so we read here this lengthy quote from the book of Jeremiah that says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, talking about time in the future, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel, with the people of Judah. In other words, when I will make a new promise, a new understanding, a new uh, agreement, a new way of doing things with my people. He says, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. What's different about it? Well, one, there's uh, the, 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 the first covenants were largely, if not wholly, earthly. Uh, dealing with the blessings of peoples and, and, and the bringing of descendants and, and all these things, that was here. Now, it alludes to things that are eternal, but the new covenant speaks to new birth, rebirth in Christ, and, and a future of eternity with the Lord, as well as being able to serve him in the beginnings of eternity right here. He says, this is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. And so he gives a, uh, in Jeremiah, and then quoted again here in Hebrews chapter 8, he gives a short description of what that covenant is. He says, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. Well, what's different from that? Well, the, 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 the laws before were written on 
tablets were written uh, on, you know, with, with ink and parchment. They were written in places. Now he is dealing with the very heart. We see things like circumcision of the heart being a theme. We see the, the, the core of the heart. It's not so much about earthly deeds and earthly happenings as it is changing the very person from the inside out. He says, I will be their God and they will be my people. And that's a common way of, of stating God's place uh, and the people's place with one another uh, and in him. He says in verse 11, no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. And this, I believe, refers to the fact that Jesus as high priest removes the need for an earthly high priest. We don't have to go between anybody because Jesus is our go-between. Uh, we don't need anybody to go between us and God because Jesus does that work. He has done, is doing, and will do that work. And so we can know God personally, not through religion, not through action, but we can know God personally and intimately, that we will know the Lord and, and everyone from the least to the greatest will have that opportunity. We're living in that time of the new covenant. The last part of the quote from Jeremiah is, is Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. that says, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Now, this is a key part of this, this covenant because what happens when we give our life to Christ? In that moment, we are saved. It's no longer about sinning and offering a, a, a sacrifice, sinning some more, offering another sacrifice, and, going, and this constant back and forth of sinning and then being brought back to being clean and righteous and things like that. Christ does it once and for all. Our, forg our sins are forgiven, our wickedness is forgiven, and they're no longer remembered. In other words, it is as if they never happened. That's how righteous Jesus makes us. That's the righteousness that he and he alone offers to us. He wraps up this short chapter by saying, By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Well, what does that mean? I mean, boy, to say that, that God's commandments, that God's law is obsolete. That, that seems a bit strong. That seems a bit brazen. That seems maybe a little bit overboard. Well, that's him saying that about the old law. And if we are relying on the Old Testament law, the old covenant, to achieve and to experience righteousness in our life before the Lord, we will fall. We will fail. We will we'll miss it. We won't get it. We won't, we won't experience that because that's not how it works because that old covenant is rendered obsolete because there's a better way. There's better promises. There's the new covenant. There's the way of putting our faith in Christ and Christ imputing into us his righteousness, giving us what only he has to give that we can't give ourselves, but he freely gives it over to us. That's part of the new covenant. It's that we would, would not be dealing with taking care of our own righteousness, but rather that he would take care of our righteousness. And you see there, that's a big change. That's a, that's a huge shift from the old incomplete and now obsolete covenant to the new complete and fully relevant covenant because that's what's going on. It is, uh, it's as if we've gone from one version of technology to the ultimate version of technology. Right now, if you've got a typewriter at your house, it's probably uh, obsolete. It's probably in your garage or in your attic or in a box somewhere. You're probably not using a typewriter every day, but you may be using a computer. Now, who knows? Computers will one day be obsolete too, and, uh, and that, that's where this illustration kind of breaks down with technology because it's always coming to better technology, faster, smaller, more convenient, more pervasive, whatever we're trying to look for in our technology. But the new covenant renders the old obsolete because there is no need for another covenant after Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate Savior, and he gives us the ultimate salvation above all else and, and, and greater than all else. He's the ultimate high priest because the new covenant is the ultimate thing that God can give us. And that is a way to come back to what started in Genesis as a, the proper and good relationship between God and his creation. Um, the Old Testament law didn't bring us back there. The Old Covenant did not bring us back there. It pointed us in the direction. It got us ready to understand the New Covenant by understanding how sinful we are, by pointing out how pointless it was for us to try to do our own thing and try to earn our own way to being saved and to being forgiven. Uh, but, but the Old Testament, new, the Old Covenant does not bring back the relationship. What brings back the relationship is the New Covenant found in Jesus Christ. 
And that's the promise that he gives us. So this evening, if you're out there and you've not put your faith in Christ, I encourage you to do so today and be brought back into relationship with God the way you were created for. If you've been living your life and there's things that are missing, things that are so incomplete, things that are so uh, out of whack and out of order in your life, then it's probably because you, you're trying to fill other, uh, fill other things in to meet the needs uh, that only God can meet in your life. And if that's the case, then today you can put your faith in Christ and have those needs met. Will everything become perfect? Well, in God's eyes, it will be in your life. But for you, you'll still grow. You'll still experience struggle. You'll still have wants and needs and things like that. But God will be meeting those things and growing you in it. And so today you could start your relationship with Christ in this new covenant that promises salvation for you in exchange for you giving your life over to him and, and being willing to glorify him by sacrificing your life and the things of it for all of eternity. I tell you what, it's a good trade because what my life is worth to God compared to what his salvation is worth to me, um, man, he's got a lot of other lives. Now he loves me and chooses to love me in, in a valuable way that is beyond my understanding, but uh, he's the only way I can get salvation. He can get glory from anything. So it's a better deal for you and me to put our faith in Christ than it is for him but he chooses to make it good for him. Uh, if you're a Christian this evening, then I hope that you'll understand that, that we don't, we don't, while we do live by the, the, the words of the Old Testament because they point out the character of God and we live to glorify God, uh, it's not about us checking off following rules. That's the Old Covenant. The New Covenant is that we're putting our whole self, our whole faith, our whole life in Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. Uh, and that, that in him, we find our righteousness, not because of what we've accomplished and because of what we do and because of how we behave ourselves or what side we're on of things, but because of who he is and what he has done. He's our great high priest. We're not our own. And so he is the one who's offered the sacrifice and he is the sacrifice. It's all about Jesus. Hopefully if you're a Christian this evening, then that's true in your life. Let's pray together. Lord God, you have all of this laid out, figured out, planned out, and you've carried it out. And God, we're just coming to it to try to understand it. And so often, Father, it's confusing to us, but Lord, we pray that we would trust more and more in your Holy Spirit as he directs us and guides us to understand your word. We thank you for the very embodiment, fulfillment of your word in Jesus, who makes all of this possible. Lord God, for the one who doesn't know Jesus yet, would you bring them to faith in him even now? And Father, would you help us that have put our faith in him, that do follow Jesus, to follow him and to follow you more obediently and faithfully in everything that we do. Thank you, God, for your new covenant that makes all things right if we'll but put our faith in you. Help us to celebrate you as we trust you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, folks, we hope you have a great rest of this long weekend. Hope that you're with friends, family, wherever you desire to be, and better yet, wherever God desires to have you. And I hope that you're having a wonderful time. And if you're having trouble, or even if you're not and just want to talk, holler at us. Let us know. Let us know how we can pray for you. And uh, we continue to pray for all those on our prayer list, as well as those who are, are being made, uh, we're being made aware of their situations, uh, even day by day, moment by moment. We're praying for you. And we hope that you have a great rest of this Labor Day weekend. Happy Labor Day, and God bless you.